Uh, this is part of the what part one of the series focused on diagnosis and staging. I'm Christy Call, Editorial Director of Cure. We're pleased to bring you this webcast presented by Cure and in partnership with Debbie Stream Foundation and our sponsors Bristol Myers Squibb, Daiichi Sankyo, and Merck. We have a few important announcements before we begin. We encourage you to ask questions during the event, which you can submit by typing them into the Q&A box. You'll be receiving a survey via email tomorrow. As a thank you for watching the full webinar and completing the survey, you'll be entered to you'll win a $200 Visa gift card. We're pleased to be joined today by our moderator, Dr. Zafar Ajani, Professor of Medicine in the Department of Gastrointestinal Medical Oncology in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, as well as, as Dr. Madaba Kunjanja, Section Chief of Medical Oncology in the Division of Cancer Medicine and Director of the GI Cancer Program and Medical Director of Regional Hematology slash Oncology Practices at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Dr. Daniel Catanacci, Associate Professor in the De Department of Medicine and Director of the Interdisciplinary Gastrointestinal Oncology Program and the Assistant Director of Translational Research, Research in the Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of Chicago Medical Center and Biological Sciences and Dr. Basil Reyes, Professor and Vice Chair for Clinical Research in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology and Director of the Gastrointestinal Oncology Program at Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll now pass things off to our moderator to begin our discussion. Thank you, Christy. And I want to welcome all the participants, all, all the members in the audience, patients and relatives. Um, we are really privileged to communicate with you today about the very important questions you, um, we have. We have already formulated some questions. So we, we hope that these are going to be very instructive um, for you and if you have additional questions, of course, um, our panelists, a, a very experienced group of individual will be, uh, will be answering that. So we will, uh, we will begin. I'm going to ask uh, Dan uh, about our first question, which is understanding stomach cancer diagnosis and straight staging process and this has multiple components, uh, like uh, what does uh, uh, stomach cancer diagnosis mean? And uh, explain the staging process. <clears throat> and whether the staging, once it is um, agreed upon, whether it has an influence on the treatment. So Dan? Great. Thank you, Jaffer, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, I'll start off with this question. It's, it's a very important question, and it's basically how we start our meetings when, when I'm meeting a patient uh, for the first time and they're newly diagnosed. And so the way I think about it, um, I always start with what's the problem and, and why are you here? And usually it's due to some symptoms that led to uh, a finding uh, of a stomach cancer, usually by an upper endoscopy finding it in the, in the stomach. At that point, we know there's a stomach cancer, which means that there's an abnormal growth in the stomach. And the next question we ask is, what's the extent of that problem or something that we call what's the stage? And the reason why that's important, and, and Jaffer alluded to that, is because different stages are treated differently. And so what's involved in the staging includes um, a CAT scan. So that's of the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis. And what that's looking for is to determine whether or not the cancer that started in the stomach has spread somewhere else. Some common places that it could spread to include the liver, um, the lungs, um, the belly cavity that we call the peritoneum, and the bone. Those would be um, some common places or lymph nodes that are far away from the stomach. If the CAT scan is looking like it has not spread, then by we would call that um, a localized cancer that doesn't have evidence of 
metastatic spread or stage four spread. And that would lead us to then do some other studies to do some more staging, which includes a PET scan, which is looking at then whether or not uh, the cancer has spread outside, but looking at it in a different way. CAT scans look at um, the size of things, and PET scans look at the activity of, of the cancer in terms of how quickly it's uh, metabolizing and eating sugar. And so together, they have a good sensitivity, better sensitivity than either alone. And another test that we do is called an endoscopic ultrasound, which is like the first endoscopy, but it's a specialized procedure looking to tell us how far through the wall of the stomach the cancer has grown and whether or not there are lymph nodes nearby that look abnormal or not. And that last endoscopic ultrasound is really helping us define whether or not the cancer is an early stage, like a stage one, or what we would call a more locally advanced stage, like a stage two or a three. And so after all of those procedures are performed, um, there may be one last staging procedure that we call a diagnostic laparoscopy. And that's done if the CAT scan and the PET scan don't look like there's any spread distantly and the ultrasound probe shows that there's lymph nodes that look abnormal or that the cancer has grown through the wall of the stomach through into the third or fourth layer. Then we know that there's a risk that the cancer could spread to the belly cavity that we call the peritoneal cavity that we just can't identify well on CAT scans and PET scans. And so a laparoscopy or a surgeon performs a very small incision in a, in a surgery um, that's a same day surgery where they would go inside, look there and ensure that there's no visible cancer that has spread. And they also spread fluid in the belly cavity and collect it to, to see if it's and make sure it's not in the in the fluid microscopically. And so that's all the staging procedures that one would do to really narrow down what's the extent of the problem that we're starting with. And as we've been talking about the treatments will will be different based on the stage. And so for a stage one cancer, typically we would recommend surgery alone and you wouldn't um, uh, be getting any therapies from me, the medical oncologist with chemotherapy or with radiation therapy. On the other hand, if it was a stage two or three cancer, we do know that surgery is not enough and that we do recommend chemotherapy before and after the surgery to enhance the cure rate. It improves the cure rate by helping to get rid of microscopic cells that we just can't see despite all those staging procedures we just recommended to do. And then unfortunately, if it's stage four, which means that it has spread outside of a surgical area, that means that at least today in April of 2021, we don't know how to eradicate the cancer from, from your body and surgery is not the recommended approach to deal with the issue. Rather, we treat with chemotherapy and other systemic therapies like immunotherapy and targeted therapies to help control the cancer, improve your symptoms, and to increase your survival time, but with the acknowledgement that it, it generally will not eradicate the cancer, but rather just can keep it well controlled. So I think that that's a big topic and I try to keep it as concise as I could to answer those questions. So that was uh, very well done, Dan. Thank you for that. Um, are there any comments on this particular question from Basel or Madapa? Any additional issues so I, you want to uh, I think uh, Dan did a really excellent job in providing a very comprehensive uh, review of uh, uh, staging. Uh, and uh, I think the one addition I would add is uh, during the endoscopy, we usually obtain biopsies as well uh, to establish a what's called pathologic diagnosis where we look at those samples of the tumor under the microscope uh, to characterize the tumor further in terms of uh, its its origin and 
more more likely to look at also molecular profiles of the tumor that would help predict how it would behave or maybe how it would respond to certain treatments and we can elaborate on this more in the coming questions. Okay, any other? No, I agree with, no, I agree with what Dan and uh, Basil had just said. Nothing more to add. Okay, very good. So I think we, we all acknowledge that this is a very stressful moment for a patient and their families because, um, you know, uh, we all hope that the, it will be the lowest stage um, so uh, it's very, um, very important moment and a very important few days till we can finalize this stage, at least clinical stage. Okay, so that's very good. I think we can move on to the next question, which is uh, completely related to the first question. So what, what do... Um, what one would do once the diagnosis is made um, in terms of patients and the family, what should they do? So the, the questions are, after a patient receives the diagnosis, what is the next step? And as we all know, patients and families, they want the treatment started the next day. Um, and what role does the caregiver place. This is also very, very important. And there are many, many aspects to this particular issue about the lo loss of wages and all the stress um, that comes with sudden diagnosis of cancer. It never comes at, at the right time. Or I should say there is never a good moment to have cancer. Um, and should patient consider a second opinion? So, Basel, would you like to make some comments about this important topic? Of course, my pleasure. Uh, so, uh, I think after the diagnosis is established, uh, it's very important that uh, we start out treatment uh, as quickly as we can, but also on the correct track. Because as Dan mentioned earlier, uh, treatment options are complex. They could be ranged from surgery to chemotherapy plus surgery or to chemotherapy alone or immune therapy or immune therapy plus chemotherapy. So there are many options for therapy. And this is why it's important after we establish the diagnosis uh, to uh, consult with a team of experts, uh, especially in early stage disease where multimodality therapy or treatments with chemotherapy, radiation and surgery from different specialties may come into play, it's very important to put together a team uh, and establish a right approach to manage the uh, complex condition like this. Uh, in addition to the medical specialties that are involved in managing these cancers, like medical oncologists, like the people on the call today, surgeons and radiation doctors, patients with stomach cancer need a number of people who support them with respect to nutrition, uh, uh, symptom management, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is why it's important to really, uh, after we establish the diagnosis, to put together the team that will be able to deliver a complex care plan uh, that is needed to take care of a complex problem like this. In addition, uh, more and more we learn that the stomach cancer is not uh, one disease, but actually many different kinds of diseases. Uh, that can be classified by us testing uh, the what we call molecular features of the tumor or the things that make the, the tumor function in the way it does. Uh, and through that molecular testing, we are able to, uh, number one, sometimes understand better how the tumor is going to behave, and more importantly, know more what is the best treatment for that specific tumor. Uh, not everybody who walks through our offices with stomach <laughs> the same treatment if they have the same stage. The treatment is much more complex and based on, in addition to the stage, uh, only molecular features of the tumor. So those are important next steps. I think the caregiver is uh, key in this disease. Uh, uh, Dr. Ajani spoke a little bit about the financial implications of having a diagnosis of gastric cancer. 
there are a number of other implications that come with this patients, uh, even in the earliest stage where they are going to be treated with surgery alone, uh, still need a lot of support after surgery in terms of uh, recovery from the surgery, nutrition, uh, physical therapy, and so on and so forth. Uh, needless to say, when treatment becomes more complex and entails things like chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, uh, the uh, support that patients need at home to, under to go through uh, such a procedure, uh, such a complex treatment is uh, quite taxing on the caregivers. And then, uh, so there's the financial aspect, there's the bio supportive aspect, and then there's also the uh, emotional or the stress of having a diagnosis and the uncertainty of uh, dealing with uh, a serious illness like this where the patient really would need uh, the caregivers to support them through, uh, through the journey uh, dealing with a disease of this nature. Uh, so caregivers play, a, I think, a key role uh, in uh, supporting patients and uh, deal with this diagnosis. As far as second opinions are concerned, uh, I do think second opinions are uh, very important because uh, really none of us uh, know the field completely and sometimes having someone else look uh, at uh, a case will provide uh, a point of view that your own oncologist did not consider. In addition, it becomes even more important if you are being taken care of uh, in an institution that does not have a lot of uh, track record in taking care of gastric cancer patients or stomach cancer patients. This is not a extremely common type of tumor, so unless you are uh, in a larger center, your medical team may not have a lot of experience in uh, managing this type of cancer. So it's not wrong to get a, a second opinion, especially if uh, if you are being you are being taken care of in a smaller institution. Uh, in addition to the fact that a second opinion can provide uh, uh, access to a higher uh, level of specialization, uh, you may get also sometimes input about availability of clinical trials, which is another important uh, part of the management of this disease, especially in the more advanced stage. Uh, those are things that you could. Uh, learn from a second opinion. So I feel like a second opinion, if available, uh, is important. Of course, we have to balance the second opinion against uh, the delay in treatment uh, because we don't want to delay treatment while we get multiple opinions, but we have to balance getting the treatment started on time while obtaining that second opinion to make sure that we've covered all the bases. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, uh, that was very well done. And I'd like to ask uh, Dan or Madapa if you uh, have any additional comments on this particular question. I think the only uh, comment I'll make is that um, I think to Basil's point, the psychosocial component of this is just so important and both for the patient and for the caregiver. Um, and that is where I think supporting them emotionally and physically during this whole thing cannot be reiterated enough because for a caregiver, the, he or she who's caring for a loved one is working, taking care of um, being a true caregiver and kind of bearing the burden of everything else that typically was two people were sharing that burden. So one of the things, at least in my um, thing that I've seen happen often is there's a lot of focus on the patient and then sometimes we tend to uh, we tend to um, forget about the caregiver, and therefore that support, the psycho uh, oncology support, is extremely important. That's one part of it. The second thing is with regards to um, um, the second opinion. I truly think, especially uh, like Battle mentioned, this is one of those wherein getting that second opinion in a timely fashion is just extremely important because sometimes we've had patients with locally advanced disease and they go in and they're trying to get the second opinion and that takes almost a month and we know time to treatment is a huge predictor in terms of uh, survival uh, and survival and outcomes so those are the only two comments but otherwise i think um uh, battle uh, uh, wrapped it up very nicely i i would agree with all of that and with the caregivers it's very critical i would point out uh, we encourage second opinions, even third opinions, because it does help with 
the difficulty of understanding everything that's going on to hear consensus with major issues like stage and what the general therapy should be. Um, at the same time, too, you know, you're talking to uh, academics here that are at tertiary, like tertiary academic centers that are always trying to do better than the standard of care. And we always have clinical trials that are looking at questions, can we do better than what we do normally? And getting second and, and third opinions, you can see what other treatment options on clinical trials there might be. And different centers have different studies. And so by, by looking around at that, you sort of get a full picture of, of all the possibilities and treatment options. And then you have sort of all the things on the table and you can pick what you feel is right for you in, in, in collaboration with your your doctor that's acting as your consultant. So I, I would also say though, and what, what both of the others have said is that you have to balance that with, at some point you have to start therapy and you can't wait too long doing all of that before you get going. So it is a, a balance, but at the same time, rushing in and missing out on potentially good opportunities is, is also potentially not a good idea either. Okay, thank you very much. I think we uh, we will probably come back to some of these topics uh, when we go into question and answers. And uh, let's go to question number three, which is uh, another very important question is uh, how to recruit a treatment team and how can a patient learn more to ensure that they're being treated by somebody who, who has had experience with stomach cancer uh, and not necessarily someone who treats stomach cancer occasionally. Um, so uh, they, the question also includes the importance of multidisciplinary approach. And uh, why is it so important that they're getting the right treatment from the right team, it says. So Madhapa, do you want to elaborate on some of the answers? Absolutely. I think some of it is kind of repetitive in its own way, but I think it's such an important question that I think it definitely bears um, uh, repetition here. So the first question is how can a patient learn more to ensure that they're being treated by the right team? And that is a critical part of it because especially in early stage cancers, going to a high volume center, having that multidisciplinary approach. And when we say multidisciplinary approach, it is not just the surgeon, um, um, surgeon, radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist, it's truly that entire team. So when we have that, one of the things that is important is when, and also figuring out or ha having a candid conversation with the patient, I'm sorry, with the physician that's treating you, how many of these patients have you treated in a year? How often do you see this diagnosis? And that kind of alludes to some of the things that um, Dan brought up as well with regards to clinical trials. Ideally, with every stage, we, the first option is a clinical trial, an appropriate clinical trial, I would say, because all, all of our trials tend to have a randomized arm burden. At the very least, you'll be getting the standard of care, which is where if you do not have any clinical, op if clinical trial options, then you're getting what is the standard of care? And the other uh, part of uh, going on to a clinical trial is that you have the option to get investigational therapies, whether it is in an early stage cancer, whether it's in a late stage cancer. So I think that is an integral part of it in the context of when you're trying to decide on the right team is to have that candid conversation with the, with the um, physician who's treating you. The second part of it is how, what is the role of a multidisciplinary team? in this whole, or rather a multidisciplinary approach in this whole treatment of gastric cancer. This cannot be more important, especially in the resectable uh, situation more, because that's when truly a trimodality treatment in certain cases, or basically when you're using radiation, you're using surgery and you're using chemotherapy, to get the best outcomes can come into play. So it's important to have all of, all of these physicians sitting around a table looking at your scans, trying to figure out, hey, we've had the, um, the laparoscopic thing, this is what we saw, and having that candid discussion one-on-one -on -one before they come up with this treatment plan per se. 
Well, we're planning out the treatment plan also as a part of this multidisciplinary approach is basically involving the dietitian or the nutritionist because as most of, uh, in most of these cases or a significant number of these cases, weight loss and cachexia, cancer cachexia is a true entity. And you do not want to go into this. You want to go into this with everyone in your corner. And that's the reason why having a dietitian there and in occasional cases having a genetic counselor in these one to three percent of these genetic tumors, because I think somebody asked us about stomach cancer in one of these questions below, and we'll go get into that later, it becomes important. So gone are the days wherein it was just chemotherapy, chemotherapy, chemotherapy alone, or just surgery up front per se. One of the changes wherein we've seen that, and the uptake is almost two thirds of the country um, does that as well, which is looking at therapies prior to surgery. And some of it is what Dan alluded to, wherein you're trying to make sure that you, the, although the tumor has not spread at this point in time, you want to ensure that this micrometastatic disease is certainly controlled prior to going into a surgery to get the best outcomes. And all of these are only uh, rendered in an appropriate way when you have a multidisciplinary team working together. So the question is, I mean, why is it important for patients to... Um, make sure that they're getting the right treatment at the right time, right, and from the right team. That is because you really can't, once we get things started, the very few times when, especially in a curative setting, the very few times when you can take a step back and say, yeah, it's already done, let's move on. And, and yeah, we tend to do it if the uh, approach is not accurate. But however, to get the best outcomes, it's trying to do it at the right time with the right team. And I think that's why large volume centers make sense and people who are more comfortable treating this in all the modalities um, um, make sense. And even if it's staging, I mean, if somebody is doing an endoscopic ultrasound and staging, and this is not somebody who does that on a regular basis, that can be inaccurate as well. So, so that is, yeah, so that I hope I answered all of those questions um, that were addressed, Dr. Ajani. Yeah, thank you. That was very well done. Um... We have a few moments to, to dwell on this particular question. So, Basil or Dan, any additional points you want to raise about a multidisciplinary approach? Do stage four patients uh, really, do they need that? Or uh, we, we focus on earlier stages and do we allow one of the team members to make the final decision or it's better to make a group decision some comments on that well maybe i'll go up then go ahead go ahead then i'll go after you okay you may be muted because we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, now okay. we can. Okay, so um, I was going to agree with what was said and uh, pertinent to the questions that Jaffer just asked. I, I think that the multidisciplinary um, approach, which generally typically means like looking with surgeries, with radiation oncologists, with gastroenterologists and pathologists, many of our centers have weekly meetings that uh, review cases that are complex, um, including gastric cancer patients, to go over all of the information, the staging, the pathology, et cetera, and to weigh in on what we think is the best approach as a consensus opinion. However, Jaffer pointed out, like, is this happening with every stage four patient? What, what are the types of patients that, are, that this is going on for? Generally, it's for earlier stage patients that are, you know, stage two or three that are going to have multidisciplinary approach to their care. But that said, almost all patients are at least reviewed there at the first meeting just to ensure that we agree on the staging, especially if it's not clear to review the imaging, etc. So I think as Mundapa was mentioning is that you really want the staging component can have a lot of subjectivity and in, in places that don't have high volumes of these cancers, they, you know, they, may, they may have different sort of stage in terms of what they're calling a certain cancer. So 
Um, that that's a very important point. Um, and then the other part of multidisciplinary care that was mentioned outside of that is very important, even and probably more so for the stage four setting in terms of having palliative care physicians and teams and um, and uh, nutritionists on, involved in their treatment. So, you know, maybe the multidisciplinary team is slightly different in each of those stages, but multidisciplinary care is always welcomed in having more sort of minds um, sort of addressing a given problem together. So I, I would just extend what was already said in, in a certain way. I agree, I agree with Dan and uh, with what he, what he just said. I think in stage four, uh, the multidisciplinary team component may be a little bit different than what it is in uh, stage two or stage three. But definitely, we do benefit from having uh, input on nutrition as many times an a major issue in these patients, uh, supportive care in terms of pain control, control of other symptoms that come sometimes with treatment. That is an important aspect. Uh, uh, psychosocial component of taking care of these patients, uh, also that's part of the multidisciplinary team that's involved. And occasionally, when you have uh, uh, these uh, unusual molecular features in the tumor, uh, engaging pathology and uh, your molecular tumor board to sort of uh, figure out what the best approach also in management of certain unique molecular profile tumors is, is also important. So there are many aspects and complexities uh, to the management of stage four that require uh, a little bit different type of multidisciplinary team, but still a multidisciplinary team maybe a little bit less role for surgery and radiation, uh, but more role for those other uh, partners who work with us on the care of these patients. Okay, thank you so much. So we, we're going to the last question and I'm going to um, ask all of you to help me with this particular question. Uh, so the, the, the question itself is the key questions patients should ask their doctors and healthcare team. And this is a big one. Um, so it's about diagnosis, treatment, side effects, schedule, um, additional issues that they don't discuss is the copay and uh, whether they will be able to get medication or not. Um, so one thing I want to mention, um, you know, as providers, we recognize that the patient and family are under huge amount of stress and the amount of information they can really absorb and also the amount of information we give them is just enormous. Um, so in, in that context, how do you transfer important information to the patient and caregivers I used to say before that I, I would explain the toxicity, such as uh, management of diarrhea or nausea, vomiting to the caregiver rather than to the patient, because patient wants to know, you know, what is their longevity, curability, um, and they they want to know the toxicity, but how to manage toxicity sometimes is best done by the caregiver uh, so they can learn some of the algorithms that we we mentioned so um can can uh, all of you just mention a couple of points that i may have missed as to what what do you think is really important for families and patient to learn from the treating team uh, that uh, sometimes, you know, they will come back and say, you never mentioned that or never explained that. And of course, you can't really explain um, everything because there's so much information out there. So how do you balance all that? Any comments? Okay, I'll jump in since uh, both Dan and Basil not jumping into this, but the way I look at this is almost breaking it up into four different categories. One is 
And, and you're absolutely right, uh, Jeff. This is one of those wherein when patients come in for the first time, most of them, although we try to fragment it up, what I tell them is I'm just going to give you the big picture here. And then we'll delve into a couple of things, and on the subsequent visit, that's when we go into and basically give it the, uh, piece, by, piece by piece, so to speak, because it can be overwhelming on the first day. So I try to hit on the highlights of each of those things. So the way I break it down is, I mean, it's basically four different categories that I'm looking at. At the time of the initial diagnosis, what are those questions that are key questions that are important for them in terms of the stage, in terms of the type of tumor, is it curative or not? And the second part of it is when it comes to treatment planning, and that's the second part where we discuss clinical trials, we say this is the stage, this is what we're thinking about, these are the um, multidisciplinary people that you need to meet within the uh, team, and kind of talk to them about the risks and the, the uh, risks and all of this in the context of the therapy, how the side effects would be, and basically how if some of them are still working, so how it would affect their day-to-day -day life. And that's when we talk about even the financial part of it, the commu commuting, just coming here to get their chemotherapy. Do they have somebody who can drive them? And then that's when I get the navigator involved as well. The third part of it is the actual treatment itself. And on treatment, that's when there's a much more extensive discussion with regards to the side effects, how often do we get scans, and what is the goal of the treatment. That is almost an ongoing uh, discussion. Then the other things such as exercise, such as nutrition, all of those are kind of discussed at that point. And then in the curative is after treatment, then what? Because some of them still end up having, um, if they have a feeding tube or any of that, and then start talking about those. So that's the way I break it down, only because it can get overwhelming for patients when they come in if you just give them everything. And, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, one aspect that you both touched on is uh, the definition of success. Like, what is successful treatment? What's the goal of treatment? Because that's not always the same in stage one, in stage two, in stage three, in stage four of stomach cancer. Uh, and not just what is, is what is success from our point of view, but also what is success from the patient's point of view. Uh, and that's, of course... Uh, also becomes, I think, more complex when you're dealing with stage four disease. And especially if you're treating with, dealing with a lot of patients that we see in our practices, patients who have stage four who have gone through treatment and are coming for second opinion and second line or third line setting. Uh, I think it's important to understand what what is success, what are we trying to achieve, uh, and to ensure that we have our definition of success and the patient's definition of success uh, are matched, uh, that that the goals that we are setting from this treatment uh, are really the goals that are meaningful for the patient as well. Uh, and again, I think sometimes this is not, not as straightforward as it sounds to be. Uh, and I do think that can influence many times the choice of therapy, the duration of therapy, the starting time of therapy, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Dan? Yeah, I, I would r really agree with everything that was said and, and really emphasize what Basel was just saying in terms of setting the goals and, and what is the definition of success from the point of view of the patient. Because uh, especially in the stage four setting, that, that can be very subjective in terms of what the goal of therapy is and, and what we're willing to concede in order to try and achieve that in terms of side effects and, and other inconveniences of the therapy. So that's really critical. I'd also just sort of point out that the, because the, the question in, included sort of how do we deal with all this information and how do we relay it and what questions should patients ask? I, I will say that a, a patient who has already had a consult or two and now seeing me as a second or third opinion those though there's already a lot of information that's been relayed to the patient and the pa generally usually and they've always typically had some time for it to sink in and they've even maybe gone and done some reading on their own so those those meetings i think that we can we can go a little bit further and go into more depth but in the 
truly newly diagnosed and this is the first time the patient is seeing the physician uh, or a medical oncologist, then then I think that it's really challenging to, to get much of that through because we're just sort of facing the first sort of shock of what's going on. And, and so in those instances, uh, I think that uh, Kondrata said that we just sort of hit the high level points that are really important. Like we need to know the stage. Sometimes we don't have the full stage at the first meeting and we have to do some more tests. And so we, we sort of indicate we need to know that first before we can be, be more definitive in what the next steps are. And so it's through a period of multiple visits in the first um, couple of weeks where we continue to build on, on what we've learned from the previous meetings uh, in order to get sort of all of the picture across to something that's very foreign and new and scary um, to the patient and their families. And so, uh, you know, I think that th these are all points. And then patients, I, for me, I always give them my email um, and, and other doctors have different ways of communicating with the patient because w we know that you have questions that will come up after the meeting that you didn't think of at the time or whatever. And so all, all, all of the, us, I think, want to make ourselves available to answer those questions that when they come up and either at re next visits or even in between, um, I, I think many physicians are willing to do that. So um, I think that's all, all I would add um, to what was already said. Okay, thank you so much. I think very important point. So, uh, you know, just to elaborate on what Dan said in a very short um, manner is that, um, you know, we are not expected to give all the education and information in one setting. I, I think it will be impossible to absorb that. It will become ineffective. So I think it's uh, it has to be done sta stage-wise. And sometimes um, I tell the family and the patient that let's wait a little bit longer till we uh, Till we are sure, till the treating team is sure what to recommend, rather than hypothetically mention three, four treatments, and it creates a big confusion later on. Okay, so I want to remind the uh, patients and families to start typing your questions. We have a couple of questions to start with, but uh, please uh, add your questions in the Q&A box, so we can answer them. So let's go to question number one. This is my father died of stomach cancer in 1995. Um, how often should I get an endoscopy and or colonoscopy? I think this is a very, very important question. Um, let's see who wants, Basil, do you want to answer that? Uh, sure. So I think it's important in these settings to know if there's an established familial syndrome, like, uh, for example, Lynch syndrome, or a syndrome that is known to cause uh, uh, inherited uh, risk for stomach cancer. And to know that, you would need to do uh, genomic testing, but not on the cancer, but genomic testing on the blood or the normal tissue, like from the mouth swab. Uh, and uh, the screening plan would depend on the risk, which is partly dependent on whether you have those familiar trends or not. Okay. And uh, many of those familial types of cancers carry risk for more than one cancer also. So knowing that may impact also the types of cancers you need to screen for, not just the frequency. Yeah, so I think that's a very important point. Uh, because if the patient themselves are young, then they may have inherited something from their parents that led to uh, the cancer. Not just that, but you know, always there is interaction between the genes and the environment. Um, but suppose the patient is 65. Uh, do we think their their children? need to be vigilant about themselves getting 
the same type of cancer? Or are there any recommendations for them? Dan? Now, I think it's an important question, and, and some of the follow-up questions I see there are, uh, are what are the symptoms that I would be looking for early on. And so mm -hmm. I think, as Basil mentioned, um, and, and also Jaffer too, uh, um, unless a patient um, had a known uh, germline, we call that germline or inherited gene that is known, and then family members are tested for that, and they have essentially a 50% chance of getting that gene or not from, from their, their parent, uh, then th they would be at risk and potentially recommended to get early screening. But the majority of the cancers that we see that are stomach cancer are not known to be germline. And the, the patient that got cancer in the family wasn't young, which we define as less than 40 or at least less than 50. So Joffre's patient at 65 generally um, would not be recommended uh, to be having any specific screening other than routine health care that would be considered followed on with a primary care doctor, et cetera, and getting screening for other cancers that we do routine screening like colon cancer. Um, that said, uh, it should be noted that Basil has been talking a lot about doing gene sequencing of the cancer cells in patients, and we do that so we can identify treatments for patients. But these days, some companies do parallel sequencing of not only the cancer cells, but also the patient's normal cells that we get from the blood. And so we do that for multiple reasons because it helps to be sure that the mutations are real, et cetera. But at the same time, as an extra now, we're getting inherited gene sequencing back. And sometimes we identify a gene that looks like it's a problematic gene, but even in the normal cells. And so it, and th this can happen even in patients who you would go under the radar from what we normally might recommend to go to a genetic counselor and talk about this. So this is becoming more prevalent now with this type of sequencing, it should be known. And if that's the and case that's and, something, and something like that is identified, then then patients and their families might be recommended to go discuss with a with a uh, genetic counselor. But overall, my impression of it is that it's relatively rare that there's a known inherited problem. Okay, thank you. We are getting uh, a number of questions now, which is great. So I urge you to keep your answers, uh, you know, shorter, so we can get to all of them. So there is another question. Uh, um, it's about uh, original symptoms. So very, very briefly, if, uh, we can mention that. But the second following, uh, following sentence is: Why should someone decide to seek? A stomach cancer treatment. This this is a more profound, profound question. So, um, Adapa, you want to take this question and give us a brief answer? So, are we talking about the symptoms, or are we talking about both of these questions? Would you mind uh, dealing with both? Oh, absolutely. So yeah, so the symptoms, I mean, that's one of those wherein it can be very vague symptoms. You could come in with weight loss and um, you could have problems swallowing. You could, especially if it's more of a proximal stomach tumor, occasionally, and then you could have nausea, vomiting, uh, just the feeling of fullness per se. And occasionally patients sometimes um, come to my clinic with a GI bleed, which is picked up by a PCP because they're having some uh, uh, they're having anemia. So all of these are very nonspecific symptoms. But one of the things that's, I think, important for patients to recognize is the fact that when you have a, 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 a symptom that's persistent and you can't attribute it to something else, that's when you need to come to a healthcare provider and be evaluated. Now, coming to the second question that Dr. Ajani mentioned, yes, this is a pretty profound question if you're talking about why seek treatment. And I think over here, the way I would at least approach this, at least in my practice, is what are, what are your goals of treatment? And is it a curative or is it more in the context of um, prolonging survival? And if you're prolonging survival, what are you giving up? 
from a context of toxicities, and there it's a fine line. So let's, if it's a curative setting, then I think that's where everything else that we've spoken about, um, multimodality, treatment planning, and all of that. So I'm just going to spend a minute on the stage four disease, wherein at that point, the way I would look at it is to balance your quality of life and your quantity of life. And that's where talking to your physician and saying, okay, you're giving me these treatments, what are the alternates? Basically, what if I don't do it, what am I going to experience? And having that candid conversation and then making a decision at the end of it, if you want treatment or not, would be important. And again, what your goals are if you're trying to, if, 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 it's, if, it's in the, if it's six months that you're trying to get to a life event and then trying to weigh out the pros and cons. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, so we, we have, I think, another three, four questions and only five minutes. Next question is, intestinal metaplasia treatable successfully? Dan? Um, um, yeah, so we, if a patient has intestinal metaplasia that was found uh, because they had symptoms that were just described like like upset stomach or acid reflux or something like this, and they and they've they've found intestinal metaplasia. Uh, particularly, we see that in the far end of the esophagus, and that's called Barrett's esophagus. Then patients like that would be screened and and surveilled with with periodic endoscopy to ensure that that metaplasia, which is a pre-cancer in a way doesn't progress to a more invasive cancer. And um, the majority of them do not. And so that's the challenge is because most patients' tumors will not progress to become an invasive cancer, or most patients' intestinal metaplasia. But we do know that that's a precursor lesion before it becomes cancer. So in terms of trying to treat it, other than just surveilling it, sometimes for stomach cancer specifically, the reason why that that's there is because of an infection, which is a common cause of stomach cancer like H. pylori. And so we would treat that infection with antibiotics and potentially the intestinal metaplasia would improve as well as with antacids. But um, the, the endoscopist would be the one doing the surveillance and sometimes they do do procedures to it like the far end of the far end of this where, where they uh, can ablate it with various um, procedures but it's a little bit outside of the medical oncologist's jurisdiction so to speak okay thank you uh, Basil um, when you say if we have to say word surgery do you mean removal of the entire stomach or part of the stomach how do you communicate that? So there isn't, uh, unfortunately, one answer for that. Uh, the goals for surgery are, number one, to try and get rid of the cancer, uh, and number two, to try and preserve as much of the organ as we can. Uh, of course, the number one priority is to get rid of the cancer, and whenever feasible, uh, surgeons usually would do a partial gastrectomy uh, if they can remove the cancer completely without removing the whole stomach, they will do a partial gastrectomy. If removing the cancer requires the removal of the whole stomach, uh, then uh, of course we would go with total gastrectomy because the number one priority is to remove the cancer. Uh, but I would say majority of cases, it's, it's more likely that you'll end up with partial than total gastrectomy. But again, it's a case by case uh, decision and with a priority to removing the cancer completely as, as our number one goal. Okay, thank you. The next one is about Barrett's esophagus with uh, frequent burning discomfort. So how often should I get endoscopy? I think Dan already um, addressed some of this and I can just elaborate on that. So if you, if you have established Barrett's it's better to remain in contact with your gastroenterologist um, because many times it it be inconsequential, but sometimes it can be it can turn into cancer, it can deteriorate into what is called dysplasia. So I think there is no fixed endoscopy schedule. It's better to remain in touch with a informed gastroenterologist, and they can really help you. So let me go to the next question, 
which is to say you use the word tumor. I thought gastric cancer was diffuse. So Dan, very quickly, what what yeah. is your answer? Yeah, so there so there are two main sort of types of stomach cancer. One is the diffuse type, as you refer to here, and one is non-diffuse, or what we refer to as intestinal type. And diffuse type, you're right, is is not a mass per se, but there are cancer cells diffusely, sp um, sparsely sort of scattered through the stomach and often can involve the whole stomach wall, something that we call linitis plastica. And so, um, you know, as, as the question about surgery, for example, that uh, Basil was talking about, really the type of surgery depends on the type of cancer, intestinal type or diffuse type, and where the primary mass is. So if it's an intestinal type, it would be at the far end of the stomach or, the, or in the middle of the stomach, et cetera, and that will dictate what surgery is done. Diffuse type, on the other hand, is one that is throughout the stomach. There's no mass oft, often even visualized on endoscopy, often can be missed with a routine endoscopy, yet it's um, a very aggressive sub form of stomach cancer. So you're right. We wouldn't be using the word tumor per se because it's not forming a mass for diffuse type, but that's one subset of the disease. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have time only for one last question. And this is, um, this is a question, it's a long text, but they're not happy really with our approach of generalizing for all patients, how we should inform them about the diagnosis, treatment, side effects, um, caregiver. Um, so they, you know, obviously, I think they're right that we cannot um, have a like a cookie cutter approach, and we don't. Um, but I think generally what we see, and and we should really respond to that, um, to be appropriate, appropriately helpful, is that there is a lot of anxiety. So when I see a newly diagnosed, not newly diagnosed, a newly arriving patient to my clinic, there is a lot of stress. They, the patient really is very scared. They don't know what I'm going to say about their cancer. And when you start up talking about treatment, there's a lot of information. So, uh, but the, the person asking the question, they're absolutely right that we, we cannot uh, uh, treat every patient and family in the same manner because they are not. They, their needs are uh, can be very, very different. So we, I apologize if we came through like, uh, there is only one way we deal with every gastric cancer patient and their family. It is not like that. So I think we are almost uh, done. Um, and I want to thank uh, the panelists for being so uh, useful uh, in formulating the answers and collaboratively helping cancer, gastric cancer patients, particularly in their families. So Christy, anything else we need to do before we close? Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. And uh, I, I know there are more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I'd like to just mention that this has been recorded and this is available to you on, on, on a webinar. Uh, there is a webinar on demand page on cure, curetoday.com. So please visit that website and you can see our answers. I uh, want to thank our panelists, uh, as I mentioned, the audience uh, for participating today. I think this is truly um, a good uh, set of information that will be helping next generation of patients and families. And we want to um, acknowledge the, the CURE Foundation, Debbie Stream Foundation, 
Bristol Myers Squibb, Daiichi Sankyo, and Mark for helping to put this together. And uh, there, there will be an email coming to all the participants tomorrow. Uh, that will be for the survey, and you can win the gift card. And uh, take care, everybody. Get get vaccinated. All the best. Bye.